Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our webinar Wednesday. We are excited to spend some time with you today to talk about the application beyond just the academics for that review. We hope that this will alleviate any stress that you have and give you the appreciation that we have on our end that you are so much more than your GPA and test scores. So we look forward to kind of breaking down that application to talking about all different components and what you can do to best present yourself through your application. My name is Emily Herbert, and I'm one of the Senior Assistant Directors of Admission at Franklin and Marshall College, and I am joined today by two wonderful colleagues. Uh, so I will let them introduce themselves, and we will jump right into things. Hi, my name is Erin Bernard. I'm an Associate Director of First Year Admission at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, um, and I've been here for about nine years in an admissions um, for about 10 or 11, depending on what kind of um, student experience you count. But um, yeah, I'm excited you guys are here. Hello, everyone. My name is Joseph Martinez, uh, pronouns he, him, his, and I am Senior Assistant Director for International Admission at Fordham University in New York City. Um, I have been in admission for about eight years now, um, working at a few different institutions here in the city um, and I'm, ha I'm happy to be joining my colleagues from UMass Amherst and Franklin and Marshall. So with that, I will pass the microphone back to Emily. Great, thank you. Um, so throughout our presentation today, we invite you to submit any questions that you may have through the Q&A box. We will do our best to get to every question, but if for some reason we do not, we will follow up with you after the presentation this morning. Just give me just a moment. Okay, so like we said, we're going to be talking about the application this morning and all the other components that will go into the application and the review from the college side. We're excited that we can bring multiple perspectives to you today as we represent a few different types of institutions and as you can hear, um, years of experience in the field. So um, as you know, these are your panelists this morning. And we have our contact information available at the end and are of course happy to work with you throughout your process. So our topics that we will cover today as we are defining what that beyond is, beyond your academic transcript and your test scores, we're gonna start with a focus on what a holistic application review means and then break down all the other parts of the application that you see here. And I'm going to turn things to my colleague, Joseph. All right. So to kick things off, um, it's important to understand that no matter from where you are applying, we will be looking at your application holistically. And what that means is um, it is a process that takes into consideration everything beyond your grades and your test scores, if you have test scores. And we'll get to that later. Um, but more specifically, especially this year, with so much happening around the world and in different communities in this country, it's going to be contextual. And it has always been contextual, but we wanted to highlight that this year as there are so many doubts that are going into your daily lives with schooling, with modality of classes, and all those different things. Um, so as you all have had to adjust in this new normal, so too have we adjusted our processes and our understanding of where you are coming from. Um, there are several types of institutions across the United States. Um, the three of us here represent um, selective or maybe somewhat selective institutions um, from the Northeastern part of the United States. Some of you may be aware that there are over 4,000 um, plus four-year institutions across the United States. And unfortunately for you all, we all got together one day and said, you know what, let's do things a little differently um, just to make the process interesting for all of the applicants. Um, so it's important to understand that we are covering a broad perspective of what holistic means today. Um, every institution is going to be different. <clears throat> and I'm sure you're looking at institutions across the country that offer different strengths, that offer, that cater to your different needs, yet somehow you do find that fit with the institution. Um, so it's important to understand that we might be looking for different things, but the reality is 
when we're looking at things beyond academics, we're going to be looking at the, the topics we're going to cover today, your writing, your co-curricular activities, what others are saying about you, what you've spent your time doing when you're not in the classroom. That's going to matter to us because holistically, we want to know what kind of student will be on our campus, in our uh, residence halls, in our dining spaces, and in our clubs and activities. Um, and then as you see here, of course, you know, COVID has, has changed much of that um, in terms of how we exist on campus, how we interact on campus currently, um, but that still doesn't change that we're looking for students who will make an impact, whether that is in a virtual setting or in a physical setting. Um, so we will be looking at those things in your application. Um, and I know that my colleagues, um, Emily and Aaron, have a wealth of experience and certainly have uh, information to add to everything I just said. So. I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic um, over to Erin um, to see if she has anything to add, and then we will continue. Thanks. Yeah, I think the, the biggest thing I want to add, just to go into a little more detail about context, um, and that we're really looking at you within the context of your environment, within the context of your school. So what opportunities have you been given? What have you taken advantage of? Um, and so that's different for everybody. And so we're, we're not just looking at you and comparing you to other people within the same exact context. Um, you know, everybody comes from a different school comes from a different background and there's there's a lot of different things that play into it so we do take the time to kind of understand how successful you are with the with the support you've been given with the opportunities you've been given um and that plays a, a pretty big role uh emily yes and to wrap this up um two kind of final points and one will build off of what joseph started with we talk about you know, our communities and how dynamic they are and students are involved and what the classroom setting is like. And the only way we can have that sort of a community is if we're looking for students that have that same appreciation, that same type of involvement, the same academic strengths that we expect our students to have. So it's important that we're taking this holistic approach to ensure we are building the community that we have promised you. Um, and I think the other thing to keep in mind with a holistic review is that we are always looking to admit students. This is not going to be um, you know, a process where we are saying like, we're only admitting one. So you know, what does this student not have going for them? It's much more the opposite. It's what has the student done? What are they bringing to our community? Wouldn't we be lucky to have this student come to any of our colleges? So that's always the approach that we're taking. Um, and we hope you keep that in mind because you have all put in a lot of time and energy with your application, but also with who you are and what you have contributed to your community. Oops, sorry. Okay, so I'm gonna kick things off talking about testing and test optional. As you guys know, oftentimes the favorite part of the application is that testing the SAT, the ACT, um, possibly subject tests as well. Historically, that's been a really big part of applying to college in the application review in many different layers, whether that be general admission or other uh, reviews for majors or scholarships, language proficiency. But with COVID, this has really been a time that schools have had to reevaluate what we are asking students to provide and how we're utilizing information to best evaluate a student's capabilities. So it's been a really interesting time for schools to say, do we really need test scores? Because there's so many students out there that haven't even been able to sit for an SAT or ACT once. Um, and oftentimes students can't sit for a second try. So we're very understanding that this is the reality that you're living in. And so test optional is where a school will review your application without test scores. So back in the day when I applied to college, I never submitted the SAT or ACT because they were not very strong. And when that type of review happens, it means that a school is still evaluating every part of your application. And that's why a holistic application review is so important. Um, there is a strong academic review in terms of how you are performing in classes, the rigor of the courses that you are choosing to take, but know that if a school is offering test optional, that means it's okay and they're still valuing all other parts of your application. Typically, you will indicate your interest in applying test optional on the application through possibly the school's member questions. A school then may require you submit additional materials in lieu of test scores. 
Um, it's okay to ask colleges how they are, you know, considering test optional. Is this new? How do they review an application with test scores? But please rest assured if a school is saying you can apply test optional, especially this year with everything that is going on, the restrictions that you have been faced with, that they mean it's okay and that they will utilize the other information with that holistic application review process to get to know you as a scholar. And I will let my colleagues chime in now on more logistics there. Sure, um, I will. So as someone who reads international applications, um, I just want to re reiterate everything that Emily said, certainly true. And um, we recognize for those of us in international admission that um, certainly across the globe, even before the pandemic, there were so many instances where SAT or ACT sittings were canceled for a number of reasons. And so we want to be sensitive to that, but also understand that because it is a holistic review, um, at least in my personal opinion, there's so much information that we utilize um, aside from testing that actually does give us enough information to know whether or not a student would be a fit academically, um, but also socially here um, at, at any of our institutions. And so uh, for those of you in the room from international curricula um, or curricula outside the United States, um, it's important to proceed as, process, as, as normal, but also remember that if you have any predicted scores, um, if you sat for grade 10 boards or IGCSEs or anything like that in your home country, um, now more than ever, those scores are gonna be important because that will give us context, um, as Aaron mentioned earlier, to your academic environment um, and the resources that you have available to you. But you should understand that as Emily said, Certainly, if it is test optional, if, if we are test optional, then it certainly does mean optional. This is this is no gimmick. We um, are ready to evaluate your applications as they are without testing, and we will not give any preference to students who may submit testing, um, nor will we penalize any students who choose not to submit testing. But I do want to reinforce something that Emily said, and it's important to remember that when you're responding to member questions in the common application, because that is typically where universities and colleges will ask you, do you want us to consider your test scores? Um, Fordham is no different. And so that is one of our member questions, uh, which is why I, I'm, I'm reinforcing that now for other institutions I know that are out there who have um, placed that question in the common app. Um, and I know that um, Aaron has a wealth of experience in um, specialized programs and majors. So I will now turn the mic over to her. Oh, and I see that I forgot uh, English proficient, proficiency exams, pardon me. So for English proficiency exams, um, most universities are still requiring that you prove your English language proficiency in some way. We recognize that many testing organizations have gone virtual and offered at home tests. This includes things like the Duolingo English uh, test, and we accept those, but it's important to recognize that if you attend a school where English is not the primary language of instruction, or you have attended that school for less than four years, um, most colleges and universities will require you to submit some sort of proof. But as, as Emily mentioned, it's important to reach out to each individual college specifically and to clarify their policy if it is not clearly stated on their um, website. So Aaron, back to you. Yeah. So schools that, especially before the pandemic, um, that were test optional, some of them would still require tests for specific majors. A lot of times they were kind of STEM fields. Um, so like nursing or engineering. Um, and so during this kind of COVID time, I think it's important not to assume that just because a school had that requirement before that they still have that requirement. Um, I would check uh, I think, you know, for, I know our schools um, and a lot of the schools that I've been in contact with, they're test optional across the board. So, um, you know, we have some competitive programs like engineering and business and computer science, um, where we did rely on the tests um, more than other majors, but we're still test optional for them. And we're not giving preference to those who take the tests. Um, we are going to focus a little more on, on, um, math and science grades and really, you know, look at those other holistic pieces in the application. And I think that that's an important question to ask, especially if, um, if it was a school that maybe in the past was test optional, but you required those things, tests for things like those majors or scholarships. Um, it's important to ask those questions because I think a lot of people are a lot more lenient now. 
before we move on, um, I just want to clarify that. So for FNM, um, you are test optional across the board um, as a policy that is in place. Um, I know that at Fordham, our test optional policy is a two-year pilot. Um, and in two years time, we will reevaluate our um, standing with test optional just to see how things work on our, on our end. And then I believe UMass Amherst, it is a three-year pilot. Is that correct? Perfect. So for UMass Amherst, this test optional policy will be in place for the next three years and then be reevaluated. At Fordham, it'll be two years and then reevaluated. At FNM, it will continue as a policy in place for all applicants. And I will add one additional thing, um, just for some context and an example of what you may expect as an additional requirement for students that apply test optional. FNM right now does not have any uh, requirements in lieu of test scores in the past we have. For FNM, it was um, requiring students to submit two graded writing samples in lieu of those scores. So that's one example of what may be required. It could be an additional essay or short answer that a school requires. So just make sure you're leaving yourself a little bit of extra time and asking these questions in case you will need to do anything else. Great. So our next topic is the college essay, um, which I feel like is the thing that's kind of like the most re revered and talked about. Um, and I think I think it's the thing that people put the most pressure on themselves a lot of times for. Um, and I, I try to ease people a little bit to let them know, you know, the purpose of the college essay is for us to learn a little bit more about you and what you have to offer. You know, Emily talked about the communities that we're trying to build. Um, and it, this is the only time we get to hear directly from the student. And um, so it's important that you're choosing a topic that's going to highlight those things that you have to offer. Um, and I think that one of the hardest things for a lot of high school students to do, because you don't do this a lot in high school, is to talk about yourself in an essay. Um, normally, you have a topic and you choose your argument and you support that argument. And this really, the, the topic is the secondary subject and you're the primary subject of your essay. And I think that's important to keep in mind because sometimes that does happen. People kind of latch on to that topic and they just write about that and they kind of forget to write about themselves. When we really, are, that's what we want from that is to hear your voice, to hear a little bit more about you, to learn more about you. Um, and, you know, we would like it to be well-written. Um, I think most people, you know, have either in school, they work on their essays or they have people look at it. And that's a smart idea um, to get a couple different people to look at it. And that way you just know that um, it's grammatically sound um, and keeping in mind that you don't always know your audience. So sometimes I think it's good to have a couple different people look at it. Um, I know I helped my cousin write his essay last year. Um, and that was one of the main things we talked about is like, you don't know who's going to be reading your essay. You don't know if they're going to get like your jokes, if you make them um, or, you know, you want to, he kept thinking people would infer things from his essay. And I kept trying to tell him, you can't assume that because you don't know who's reading your essay. So it's, it's good to just talk about yourself. But, um, you know, one of my old bosses used to say like, now is not really the time to try something new. Like if you're not funny, don't try to be funny. Or, you know, um, if you're not poetic, don't try to put poetry into your essay, things like that. Um, we really want it to be in your voice and we really want to hear from you. Um, I would say the biggest don't is when people put the name of a college in their essay. So they'll say like, I'm, I'm so excited to go to Fordham University and um, we get that essay um, or something like that. So that I feel like is one of the most common don'ts. Um, and I think people forget that especially on the Common App, it's like a common essay. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And one of the tips that of do's that I heard um, when I was applying to school that I thought was really great was um, they were like, when you're doing your application, just in general, write down a list of things you wanna make sure a college knows about you. And then cross off the things 
that are shown in other parts of your application. So whether that's your, your transcript or even like your activities list or anything like that. And then whatever is left, make sure you write about that in your essay so that they can kind of get this full picture of you. Um, yeah. All right, so um, as you all may have seen in many instances of the application, some institutions have added or have always had supplemental essays that are required. Um, so as Aaron has expressed with the personal essay, it's important to realize that if an institution is providing you with required supplemental essays, they are there for a reason. And it's these prompts have been chosen by the people who will be reading your essays, who will be reading your applications. And so it's a good idea to spend as much, um, maybe if not more time on these uh, personal or rather these curated questions because they oftentimes relate specifically to that institution. Um, and so that is one way that institutions will be able to really get a sense of fit and knowledge of the institution. I would recommend that if you are applying to institutions that ask you, why are you applying? Or why, why are you choosing this major to, um, at our institution? Um, remember that these folks, these people are the people who wrote the brochures, who put the language on the website. Um, so it is never a good idea to copy and paste or um, paraphrase what you've seen on the website or in the literature. Um, because it will look awfully familiar and will be unoriginal. Um, so ask yourself, is there something specific about this institution that really sticks out to me or something specific about this institution that I can find no place else? And start with that. Um, maybe if you had a chance to have an interaction with a community member or go on tour of that institution, whether virtual or in person, maybe something stood out to you. Use that as your springboard because then that will get your creative juices flowing of thinking uh, about yourself on that campus, um, about yourself as a member of that community, um, and that will often give us the most authentic response. Um, other questions may relate to the mission um, of the institution, so it's a good idea to, re to recognize if institutions um, try to instill certain values in their, in their students or at least promote community in a certain way that will often give you a hint um, as to what we may be expecting or, or looking for, or at least hope that you are open to. Um, as we have said time and time again in this process, everything is contextual. We recognize that students will not all have the same opportunities, um, will come from different backgrounds and, being, and bring different perspectives, which we all really want on our campuses. Um, but it's important to recognize that we are also still, <clears throat> we also still want students to um, at least come together on a couple of issues um, or certain things uh, of being a community member in our schools. Um, for those that are optional, um, sometimes it may be a good idea to answer those op optional questions, especially if you are really interested in that school. Um, that often says, hey, you know what? I took the time to really um, showcase my love of this institution uh, or my knowledge of this institution. And so sometimes that can really um, help your application or at least give the reader a, a sense of what you really want to accomplish. And if you are um, someone who would thrive on their campus. Um, and finally, which can often apply to many institutions, there's this thing that we like to call the whiteout test. And if you are writing um, a question specifically for an institution, and you talk about general aspects of university life here in the United States, such as location, um, club, campus activities and clubs, um, <clears throat> the uh, accessibility of professors. All of those things are things that I, at least our three institutions um, really like to promote. And so if you wrote an essay talking about those three things as an example, um, I'm pretty sure that you can white out our institution names and it would still apply. So you want to avoid scenarios where you just speak in, in generalities or speak um, in general terms, because then that will demonstrate that you really don't know our institutions. So again, you wanna highlight specific 
aspects unique to that institution so that you can uh, truly demonstrate that you've put in the time to, to research the institution, to find something you love um, and are looking forward to actually doing once you get it on that campus. Um, most supplement essays are short in length, so you don't have to spend, you know, uh, 650 words on them. They're typically about 200 or 150 words. Um, but certainly if there are required supplement essays, um, I advise you strongly not to put those off until the 11th hour, because those institutions that provide those questions are really going to be looking at those to make sure that you spent the time to get to know their institution and not just speak in general terms. Okay, the college interview. At this time, I think you are going to start to hear some of the thing, things over and over because there are certain aspects of this application process that are really important to schools. So the college interview is another way for an institution to get to know you beyond those academics. Anytime you can share new information through this process will benefit you because the better the admission representative knows you as a person, the better understanding they will have of who you are and what you're going to bring to the table. So there are some schools that offer college interviews. Not every institution will offer this, so do not worry if a school does not have an interview. Sometimes they're required for certain programs or scholarships, but oftentimes it may be an optional interview. So as you just heard optional, I always like to say, read between those lines. And if it's optional, please take advantage of the opportunity to engage with our school. At FNM, we do have optional interviews. And so if I've met a student and I've gotten to know them over the interview and I've heard their voice and I'm excited to have them at my institution, that interview has played a big role and has left an impact on me. So interviews are something to definitely take advantage of if a school offers it. Um, the word interview is scary. I think it kind of goes alongside with essay and still to this day, adults don't love interviews either. So we understand that this is a little scary and you're meeting with someone that you don't know yet and you're in high school and you're still getting to know the institution. So we recognize that and these interviews are really meant as an opportunity for us to get to know you in a casual way, but for you to get to know the institution as well. So if you think about it, you get to interview the college at the same time. So typically in an interview, what will happen is you'll sit down with either a staff member, it could be an alum, and this is a fair question to ask so you know who you'll be speaking with. Um, so you can ask, you know, who will I be meeting with during this interview? What is the length of time? Do I need to bring anything such as a high school transcript? Oftentimes the answer may be no. So don't feel like you need to come with materials to review. It's really intended to be an opportunity to talk and get to know one another. Some of the questions are going to be, tell me about yourself. What do you do outside of the classroom? What are you passionate about? But then there may be some other questions that are more targeted to get to know you um, as a thinker and your intellectual abilities and um, some questions that are maybe a little bit more creative. If you're ever asked a question and you're taken aback and you're like, oh, I didn't prepare for that one, it's okay to take a moment, take a deep breath to say, that's a really great question and have a moment to collect your thoughts because ultimately admission counselors are people that are nice. We wanna have questions. So don't feel too intimidated when you're in this sort of a setting. And it's okay if you don't have an answer right away, take that deep breath. When you are going to an interview, we expect you to be dressed well. That does not mean you need to come in your suit, but please don't come in your sweatpants. The, between the three of us, I'm sure we have seen it all. Um, and I never appreciate when a student can't bother to put on real pants. So please don't come in your sweatpants. Um, right now there are in-person interviews and virtual, and you can probably expect to have a virtual interview. So if you're a sen senior joining us today, know that that's going to be the norm. And that's probably the only thing that a school may be able to offer. If it's virtual, it's going to be a setting like this where you're looking at each other over the camera, but it's the same thing for us as it is for you. So just approach it like you would any other conversation or what an in-person interview would be like as well. Always come prepared to an interview with questions. 
I feel bad saying this, but even if you know the answer, ask a question, always come prepared to ask a question. Um, always come prepared to answer the question, why F and M, why UMass, why Fordham? So it is important to do your research about the institution beforehand. I remember when I visited schools, it was a very overwhelming experience. So if you're doing a tour, an info session, an interview, it's a great time to knock everything out, but maybe leave yourself a couple minutes to collect your thoughts, to reflect on your experience so that you can ask the questions that you need answers to. Because again, this is an opportunity for you to learn more about the institution. Um, and we are always open to questions. You know, the other day I did an interview and the student asked what my favorite thing was and what my least favorite thing was about f &M. So you can put the counselors on the spot as well. Um, so those are some of the things to keep in mind about an interview, but um, certainly practice beforehand. <laughs> That's, I think, about the first college interview I did, and I did a lot better the second time around because I had then practiced. Um, but just know that the goal is to get to know you better and what you can expect from the experience. All right, so um, as a part of the process and how we get to know our students, we will be looking at co-curricular activities. Um, and that is a section of the common application that allows you to list all of the activities you have been involved with since you've been a high school student. Um, so I wanna emphasize that the essay and the, and the supplement question are probably the, the section of the application over which you have the most control at the time that you apply. Um, at the time that you apply, your grades are already solidified. They're, they're in the bag, so to speak. Um, so they're there, they, they're out there, it's, um, it's recorded, um, as are your co-curricular activities. However, how you present them is not. Um, and so I wanna take a moment to really emphasize that students often um, really want to showcase either their depth or their breadth, meaning like how much they've done or how much they focused on. Um, and as we've said here, there's really no right activity. There's really no right approach. And so um, I always tell students, take a moment to think about those activities upon which you have had the greatest impact or the activities and things that have had the greatest impact on you and have started to shape your view of the world, have started to shape your view of your community, um, because that's oftentimes the view that you're going to bring to our campus. And it's important for us to understand that view and what you'll be bringing to our community. We also recognize that leadership is not always in the title, right? Not everyone can always be the president or the vice president um, or leader of some club or organization. However, putting in time demonstrates um, a commitment and demonstrates a leadership that we often see on our campuses. Um, and it shows the care that you put into your community and things that you're interested in. Um, so that's something that we recognize. The common application allows you to specify time spent within a club, organization, activity. Um, so it's important to really think about um, what you've really spent your time doing, because again, that's going to show us where your interests lie um, and what you will, what perspective you'll be bringing to campus. There are other things that you may be doing when you're not in the classroom that you might think may, maybe are not so special. Um, I'm talking about for those of us that have younger siblings that perhaps live with elderly relatives um, and are spending time with them, taking care of them. Those are things that we certainly want to know about. Um, first and foremost, if you're spending time doing uh, perhaps babysitting younger siblings or family members um, or being a caretaker, that's time spent that maybe you could have done uh, doing activities at school um, or leading organizations. And so that's the first um, sort of thing that we think about. However, um, as we've said, in this context, in, in looking at the whole application, we recognize that doing things like this, being a caretaker, um, often builds a character that you cannot see in grades. Um, because when you come to our campuses and you live in our residence halls, we wanna know that you are empathetic. We wanna know that you have the ability to connect with other human beings in a way that is just beyond the surface. Um, so doing things like this, shows that you care, shows that you have responsibility, that you can be responsible for others. Um, because when you come, we want you to be 
um, a neighbor. We want you to be a friend. We want you to be someone that people in your residence halls can rely on for help if they need it. Um, so those are things to consider. And we also um, <clears throat> want to emphasize that because of everything going on in the world right now, we, look, we recognize that your co-curricular activities may have been disrupted. They may have, been sh they may have shifted modalities. So maybe you were in a club or organization that met in person, did things in person, but now you did, you moved on to the virtual setting. Um, maybe you were a part of some type of COVID relief. Maybe you um, stood for racial justice in this country and, and did um, participated in movements that took place and are still taking place to this day. Um, if those are things that took time in your day and add value to who you are as a young person, coming to our campuses and bringing new ideas and fresh perspectives, certainly do write about them. Um, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, we are shifting the way, we are being a, a, a adaptable, so to speak, in the way that we look at things. And so we recognize that, yes, your grades, some of your grades may be pass fail, but also some of your co-curricular activities may have ended or may just look differently. Um, even our own institutions have put a pause on some co-curricular activities. So we're, even our own students are adjusting. So we're gonna be as flexible as possible when evaluating um, this type of, this part of your application um, and recognize that maybe your level of involvement couldn't have been as deep or as um, extensive as it would have been under normal circumstances and meeting in person. All right, so the next uh, component, we're um, really excited to get to know you in so many different ways, uh, including from the perspective of others in your community, um, particularly those who are um, your academic instructors, for those that get to know you in an academic setting, because when you're coming to university, first and foremost, you're going to be a student. You're going to be in our classrooms, and you're going to be using our academic resources, um, not only to further your knowledge, but to create new knowledge. And so when we're looking at these letters of recommendation, um, we are first and foremost looking to see that you can contribute to an academic environment, that you do simple things like show up on time and, and turn in your work, um, are able to work in groups, are able to work individually. Um, more specifically, depending on the, the person you ask, um, we, you know, as uh, institutions that have um, strong liberal arts foundations or specific uh, foundations for things like engineering or business, um, we want to hear from teachers who have had, had experience teaching you in subjects that will contribute to your first couple of years of university. So teachers that can comment on your critical thinking, on your writing, on your ability to think outside the box um, and really to process large amounts of information. So if you have teachers who have taught you in your core subjects, such as English, um, English language, a foreign language, um, and I'm speaking from the perspective of the United States. So maybe if you're in a different country and your, say, let's say your home language is Portuguese, um, and you have English as your foreign language, then switch those. Um, but then also things like mathematics, um, lab sciences, such as biology, chemistry, physics, um, social sciences, like history or um, economics, those things, those are subjects that um, require you to utilize skills that you will be implementing in your first year and second year classes at university. And so those are classes and those are teachers um, that we would probably recommend you uh, have write your letter of recommendation, though we know that the pandemic and everything going virtual has maybe shifted how you interact with those individuals. Um, I, I often say, you know, typically we want to hear from your third or fourth year teachers because that is when you've probably chosen the more, the more um, uh, rigorous courses in your school offering. Um, maybe you've uh, intentionally selected courses that no will challenge you. Um, and that still holds, however, again, with the pandemic, the context of that may have changed. And so um, even though you may have been virtual, you may not have had traditional interactions with your teachers in an academic setting, such as the classroom, we still wanna hear from those individuals um, because you certainly were still expected to turn in work to participate, even if it were in a virtual setting, um, as has been the case for our students in our on our 
campuses as well. Um, so it's a good idea to ask early. Um, the application season is well underway. So hopefully if you are a senior, hopefully you've reached out to those individuals who you would like to speak on your behalf. Um, maybe teachers that have that you've done well in their class or have really um, you know, had a turnaround and maybe you started off with a, a rocky experience, but now are, you know, really turning in, turning in great work, are participating at a high level, are engaging with the material. Those are the teachers that you should probably look to. Um, those that can really speak to your, to your achievements or maybe can speak to your personal characteristics as well. Maybe they know you from outside the class uh, and have had experiences um, with you in clubs or organizations. Um, so those are the people you, you might want to focus on asking. Um, some students may also have their college counselor or the person at their school helping them with the college application submit a letter on that on their behalf. And these letters typically have an eagle eye perspective of your place in the community, your interaction with the community, you know, how you've grown over the last three or four years. Um, so those letters also help us sort of navigate your fit with our larger um, college community but I think that the academic letter of recommendation um, is certainly going to be an, a nice look into um, what you will be like in our classroom, especially now that many of us will not be looking at um, SAT or ACT scores. This is gonna, going to be a, a nice component to really look at. Great, so portfolios um, are required for um, some programs. Um, so for example, we have an art and architecture program that uh, require you to submit a portfolio. Um, and auditions kind of, we're lumping those in as well. So auditions for music and dance, um, that's what we have. You need to make sure that, um, especially during this time, things are never as easy as um, and as straightforward as they have been that you're asking people what they're doing. So for example, we're not doing in-person auditions for music or dance, um, but we are requiring other things. So there are some um, like virtual audition options, but they're also, um, especially for dance, they're requiring some other things kind of in lieu of that in-person audition. So it's important to make sure that you're following up with each school that you're gonna to apply to if you are applying to something, um, a major that needs a portfolio or addition and seeing what they specifically require of you um, because each school is gonna be different. And I think it would be great to work with um, some kind of teacher that you have, an art teacher or a music teacher or something like that, a dance teacher to make sure that um, they see what is being asked of you by these schools or colleges, and then they can kind of help you out with making sure that you're meeting those requirements um, and getting everything in that you could need. Um, the other thing that I think is important to add is that um, ask the school how they review um, this part of your application. So for example, the way that we do it is you get reviewed by the department. So what the art department or the architecture department that's where your portfolio goes. They review that and they decide yes or no. We decide admission, yes or no, kind of separately. They happen simultaneously. So there is a chance you get into the university and don't get into that major. Um, that's not the case for every school. So some schools it might be, it's gonna be yes or no, including your portfolio. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And I think, You'll, you've seen that trend in a lot of our answers is that you need to check in with the school. Um, and I think that that, if you can get that from our presentation, that that's important, then um, I think we've at least done our job a little bit that you're gonna follow up and, and make sure to ask these questions. Um, optional submissions, I think that it would be a really good idea to work with a teacher or, um, I was about to say a professor, but um, a teacher or somebody in your life who can help you figure out what the best, if you should be submitting or not. Um, and I would say sometimes people submit portfolios, like they'll apply to business and they'll submit their art portfolio. And that's fine. Like we, we will take it and we'll look at it. It doesn't have a huge impact on um, 
the kinds of things that we look at to admit you, especially, you know, in my case, like I'm not an artistic person. I would not even really know how to evaluate your art. Um, but I think that showing that you're well-rounded and that you have um, kind of like these other interests and these other things to offer is, is usually totally fine. Okay, so you maybe have heard the term demonstrated interest. I hate that language. So uh, today we're going to talk about engagement. As you have heard us say time and time again, we want to get to know you. And so when you're engaging with the school, it's the opportunity for us to get to know you, but it's also an opportunity for the institution to know that you are interested. Ultimately, our job is to bring in a new class. And so we want to make sure we're bringing in students, we're admitting students that want to be at our institution. So there are different ways to show that you're interested, but then schools will utilize that information in different ways and offer you different opportunities in how you can engage. So again, it's okay to ask questions like, do you care about demonstrated interest or do you consider it in the review of your application? We're all going to say like, yes, we're here to help please ask me questions. Um, but some schools may utilize the type of involvement, the type of communication, the types of visits when they're making their decision. And I always like to say, if you have two students that on paper are both strong academic scholars, they're involved in meaningful ways, they have you know, very strong letters of recommendation, they're great, they're both great students and you can only admit one, you're gonna be really excited about the student that's been in touch with you, that has visited your campus. Um, so I say that with a grain of salt, especially with COVID, because we do not expect any student to take a campus tour, to interview, to email us every day. Like at some point, you don't need to go overboard. Um, but do know that there are schools that may take this into consideration. So it certainly doesn't hurt to try to be engaged with the school. There are different ways to do that. Right now, every school is going to have a lot of virtual options. We're all trying to get you all of the information in as thorough of a way as possible. So schools will have virtual tours, info sessions, um, casual chats, interviews, like the list can go on and on. Um, so don't feel like you're expected to come to campus. Um, schools will have regional representatives, admission counselors, we're all called different things but that's kind of your point person. So that's a great place to start as you're getting to know a school and also kind of appreciating if you need to have that relationship. Please don't call us every day. That's not what I'm trying to tell you, but make sure you engage with the school. Um, fill out that inquiry card or the form that's online. If you're doing an informal visit, sometimes schools will have um, a card for you to fill out just so that we know that you've visited and been to campus. Um, and then the one other thing to consider would be the different ways that you can apply and what you're telling a school through that. So as you've probably learned by now, we um, as institutions may offer different rounds, timelines to apply. There's early decision, which is the binding early way to apply, early action, the early non-binding way to apply, and regular decision. There are some few other exceptions like rolling admission or an early notification for a specialized program, but Kind of the three main rounds to think about right now would be the earlies and then the regular decision. FNM is a school that has early decision. Not every college does, uh, but for FNM, we look in we look to bring in about half of our class through early decision. And when you apply ED, it's so early that typically we are seeing very strong applicants, but we're also seeing applicants that love FNM so much that they are willing to apply through that binding method. Um, so it's not to say that you can and won't be admitted to a school that has early decision, but you choose to apply regular decision. But if you have that school that you know is the best fit for you, you're so excited, early decision is another way that you can demonstrate your interest to the institution. So just some things to keep in mind, but I hope this doesn't leave you feeling like you need to now contact every school. Just make sure to engage, get to know them, and let your presence be known essentially in the process. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, we hope you have a better sense for how colleges will evaluate an application in different ways beyond just a GPA and maybe a test score. It is a very thorough process, but we are in this profession because we like to support students and we enjoy getting to know students. So know that ultimately our goal is to support you and support our institution and that we would be lucky to bring in students that care enough to attend a webinar 
um, and that are putting in the time and energy into all components of their application. So we thank you again. I don't know um, if there are any questions um, that anyone would like to submit at this time, but if we have not gotten to your question, we will certainly follow up with you after. Hey, Emily. So I think we've actually had a chance to answer um, all of the questions that have come through the Q&A box. Um, but I will take this opportunity to remind our attendees that if you have any last minute questions that you want to ask to any of us, you can go ahead and do so in the Q&A box uh, right now. Um, but also before you, you have all of our individual email addresses. So as Emily said, um, if you maybe you didn't want to ask in a public setting um, or you haven't thought of a question yet, um, but, or maybe you're thinking of one, you can go ahead and reach out to us um, individually and we will respond uh, accordingly. But um, just, I, I don't know if you can see your screen, but we definitely have um, cleared the inbox. Um, and then we are now, uh, one technical question, um, is this event being recorded? And if so, where will it live? Yes, this has been recorded and I believe live streamed through YouTube. Um, we will follow up with attendees to clarify where this recording is being held, but we can make that accessible to students and we appreciate you asking that question. Um, and I just got word that it, it will be on YouTube, um, on the FNM page on YouTube. So um, that will be the best place to start. All right, I think, uh, I think we're, we cleared out the uh, Q&A box. Great, well, thank you so much, everyone. We have enjoyed spending this time with you and we hope you are more confident in this process and know that we appreciate who you are as a person. Thank you all so much and good luck in the college search process. Bye.